This oral, oral history interview uh, conducted at uh, one of our national meetings allows us to chat with Dr. Stanley Zinberg, who's become increasingly a figure of importance at the college for the fine work that he's done. Stan, in these uh, chats that we have and which Deborah Scarborough saves in the uh, history files, uh, we try to learn a little bit about the people first uh, and then move on to the sorts of things that they're interested in and what they believe. So starting at the very start, uh, you were born where? I was born in Brooklyn, um, actually at the Bethel Hospital. Uh, of course, I don't have a great deal of recollection from <laughs> early days, but I moved uh, to the very southern part of Brooklyn. Brighton Beach, Coney Island, when I was about four or five years old. And I actually remained there right through grade school and high school. I uh, went to Abraham Lincoln High School, which is just on the border between Coney Island and Brighton Beach. I lived about a block from the ocean, or the Atlantic Ocean, a block from the beach. Mm -hmm. uh, is that a hospital, your birth hospital, one that's still there? It's called Brookdale now, oh, okay. yeah. Just out of curiosity, of course, I'm always mystified by the New York City hospitals. You know, how many are, roughly how many general hospitals are there in New oh, York? Dozens. Dozens. Dozens and dozens, yeah. Uh, even in, in, the, in the borough of Brooklyn, there's got to be a, more than a dozen general hospitals. Tell me about growing up in Brooklyn. Oh, uh, I spent the majority of my time, I lived right across the street from the grade school. I went from grades one through eight. And I probably spent the majority of my time playing softball in the schoolyard. <laughs> um, I had two groups of friends. I had my, I call them now, retrospectively, my academic group. These were a bunch of very smart kids and who did very well in school. I managed to hang out with them. And I had my other friends, what I call my bummy friends, uh, who periodically got into trouble. and. Uh, uh, pretty much came from the same socioeconomic background that I did. Uh, uh, besides playing uh, softball, uh, I, I fenced in high school. I was captain of the fencing team. Uh, I spent a lot of time uh, on the beach, uh, just sunning. Uh, never learned to swim, even though I was right on the ocean. I'd have to uh, hold on to the ropes that went out to what's called the third barrel. I knew I was great at running into the water and jumping into the waves, but as far as swimming, that was uh, sort of out of the question. I'm not very much New York knowledgeable. Is that the same sort of a beach that's still there in that geography? Uh, it is there. It, uh, it's uh, the, uh, the, the beach that extends from Bay 1 in Brighton Beach right through to Bay 20 or more in Coney Island. I used to be able to walk from uh, my house uh, in Brighton uh, to the old steeplechase and all the rides. I used to remember the uh, uh, servicemen from the Second World War coming on leave and going into the steeplechase and uh, buying tickets and then finding uh, girlfriends coming out with these tickets with empty uh, slots in them. They'd give them <laughs> to us and we would get right in there and go on all the rides all day long. But uh, it was an interesting area. It was a lot safer uh, in terms of a neighborhood at that time, uh, certainly, than it is today. How big was your family? I had uh, just my parents and one sister. sister. Yeah, younger sister. Younger sister. And yeah. She's uh, just out of curiosity, is she still in New York? No, no, she lives in California. California. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what then about schooling? I went starting, to. Starting at the early levels. Uh, I went to a, a public school throughout uh, uh, until I went to college. I went to grade school, uh, grades uh, kindergarten and one through eight. As I said, that public school was right across the street from my. Mm -hmm. the, the apartment in which we lived. And then I uh, went to Abraham Lincoln High School. Uh, was about a mile walk. Uh, and uh, I thought it was a wonderful uh, academic institution at the time. Uh, it had its share of scary characters, but not, mm -hmm. not like today. Uh, and um, I have very fond memories of uh, a number of teachers. Uh, my Spanish teacher. I had four years of Spanish, although I can't speak anything at this time. It was a 
wonderful lady by the name of Mrs. Prozac. Uh, there were many more uh, male uh, uh, professional teachers at that time than there are, than there are today. Um, it was very important that I uh, obtained good grades. I never had a grade that was less than 90 in high school, no, but although, although I had 1,300 people graduating in my graduating class, now I think I was number 11 in the class. Now, is, is that because of what your parents wanted, or is that because you wanted to move uh, on well, to something higher? I kind of intuitively knew I would like to go to college, and it was not that easy to get in, and most, certainly to a uh, very good school. Mm -hmm. And uh, with that fine GPA, where did you go to school? I went to Columbia College. That's in Manhattan. That's located in uh, uh, on uh, 116th Street between Broadway and Morningside Heights. Uh, I, uh, I I should I should go back. I actually worked as a on, for for Coca Cola on a uh, delivery truck. And I was a teamster. I had a union card, and it was necessary to have the card or else you, yeah, you got into a lot of trouble when you appeared at work at 6 in the morning. But I made enough money working uh, uh, as a helper on a Coca-Cola truck to pay my tuition at Columbia, which was about uh, $600 a year at that time. And actually going to Columbia was the first time that I was away from home. I lived in the dormitory. Prior to that, I lived at home uh, 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 entirely. What, what then sent you on to medical school? That's really a difficult question to answer. Uh, I, I think I drifted, really. Uh, uh, I, obviously, I had an interest in science, and I had a, a, a great respect for our local family uh, physician, our local general practitioner. Uh, actually, I had, uh, like many uh, young kids, had put uh, that person on a pedestal. But at the same time, I liked photography, and I liked city planning, I liked engineering, I liked art, so I wasn't sure. But the, uh, lots of my friends who I respected were drifting in that general direction as well. And I became the traditional pre-med at Columbia and applied to medical school. Unfortunate for me, uh, I got into a medical school because I, uh, my grades at Columbia weren't great. Um, I spent an awful lot of time partying and being on a fencing team and pra long practices and traveling, you know, you uh, take the bus for 12 hours down to Annapolis on a weekend just before you have three final exams on a Monday. It's not very uh, conducive to doing well. But I, I had a, a good solid BB plus average, and uh, uh, I was, uh, I, I, I didn't have great many A's, but in my first year, at Columbia, I had an A plus in calculus, which was a shocker. You know, we'd get these <laughs> grades, we'd go down the, the hall, the grades were posted on the what we call the wailing wall. And uh, when I, I saw that, I was, that was the only time I made the dean's list, <laughs> the first semester. <laughs> first semester. Was, but, was your medical school Columbia? No, my medical school was uh, Syracuse, uh, right. which was in upstate New York. So. That was the first also. Uh, when I went for my interview at Syracuse, it was the first time I was on an airplane. And uh, I remember it was American Airlines. They had these little two-engine uh, prop planes that went, went up there. It took about an hour and a half at that time for what would, today would be in less than a 30-minute flight. And uh, I, I remember my interview at uh, Syracuse very, very well. One of my interview was a liver specialist, and when uh, we, we had a very nice chat, and when he got up, he reached six foot nine, <laughs> and I had not realized it. And the other the person who interviewed me was uh, actually the dean of the school, and we spent half of the interview talking about uh, the uh, Jack Parr show that was on the night before. And, uh, um, uh, about 15 percent of the class at Syracuse were from what you would call downstate, meaning New York City, and the other 85 percent were uh, upstaters. Um, there were 70 students in the class. There were seven women, 10 percent of the class. So we were actually a higher percentage, I think, than many schools at the time. That was a, Syracuse certainly has a good reputation now in obstetrics. Was that the case then, uh, too? Or what, yeah. what attracted Dr. You Hughes that? was the chairman, yes. and the, the departments were, uh, of Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology were separate departments. 
uh, Dr. Chester was the head of gynecology. Uh, Tommy Turner was uh, what we would call today the oncologist, but Dr. Hughes uh, lectured to the sophomore class once a week uh, and almost presented the entire textbook, uh, Eastman's textbook on obstetrics. And there, there was still uh, information he provided that I was able to use years and years later in teaching medical students. Uh, he, he was really impressive. It's interesting. I, what, do you think it was because he talked clinical to second year students that attracted you in his direction? Well, there wasn't anything else at the time but clinical when you really came right well. down to it. I just, he, every once in a while he'd talk about alkaline phosphatase <laughs> and we never really were convinced that he knew what, what alkaline phosphatase was, but uh, it, it was an interest of his. He would measure alkaline phosphatase in the endometrium, but no, he, his lectures were all clinical. And his, his uh, description of the obstetrical examination, the definition of a, of a lie, the definition of position, uh, uh, it was, and presentation, engagement, uh, were you know, basic obstetrical elements that are, that not, are not, not very well taught sometimes yeah. today. Yeah, right. yeah. The, uh, when did you decide that it was obstetrics for you? I decided pretty late in the game, actually. Um, my two interests uh, throughout medical school were medicine and obstetrics and gynecology. Uh, and I, I, I think I had the only uh, A grade in third year medicine, which was, uh, to me, my, the, the best achievement of my medical school career. But I was really undecided. Uh, I did a fellowship in the summer between my uh, third and fourth year, and I worked for a cardiologist at the Veterans Administration Hospital, a fellow by the name of uh, Abby Abelskoff, who was from Utah. And uh, I used to discuss the, the difficult decision I had between obstetrics and medicine. Uh, I discussed it with him on many occasions, and he. And one day he, you know, he said to me, you know, I, I, I assure you that if you like it, at either one of these, if you like it at all, after you're in it, you're going to realize you like it even better. Yeah. <laughs> he said, don't really worry about it. So, well, I still continued to worry about it. I took a straight medicine internship uh, uh, because that was, I think, the wise thing to do at the time. There were some people that took surgical internships, but I felt that uh, if I was going to go into medicine, I needed a medicine internship. The rotating internship really? didn't really exist. And if I was going to go into obstetrics and gynecology, a medicine internship would serve me well. And so I, I did an internship, and there was a matching program for, for internship at the time. It had just started a year or two before. And I uh, went to the Cornell Medical Division at Bellevue Hospital in New York City. Uh, and I worked uh, in a remarkable department. Uh, I, I still know some of my attendings from that time. The head of the department was a fellow by the name of Tom Almy, who was a gastroenterologist. And uh, Here I, I started the um, internship, of course, on July 1st, and I recognized almost immediately that if I was going to go into obstetrics and gynecology, I had to have a residency lickety-split because uh, by the time August or September rolled around, those uh, positions were all filled. So I went and I uh, applied uh, to uh, Columbia and Cornell and NYU, the uh, three best programs in New York City at the time in obstetrics. And I told Tom Almy that I, this was my decision. And he asked me why. And the reason why I chose, I, I was always interested in from my perspective, what I called uh, going into academic medicine. Now, academic medicine to me uh, at that time was not the same thing as academic medicine today. Academic medicine meant working in a medical school environment, teaching students, taking care of patients. Uh, it, it really didn't mean research, research. to me. So, uh, and I decided that if I wanted to really uh, move up in the ranks of academic medicine, uh, by my definition, in uh, obstetrics or in internal medicine, that I'd be able to move more quickly and probably further in obstetrics 
with the union card of an obstetrician and study the same things. If I was interested in anemia, I could study it from the standpoint of an obstetrician. If I wanted to do it, I could do it as a standpoint of an internist. But uh, uh, I, so I, I made the selection. Uh, Where did you go? For I, I, I went to NYU Bellevue. Uh, actually, when I, I was interviewed up, uh, up at Cornell, obviously because I was on the Cornell division at Bellevue, and uh, I didn't get into that program. That was a uh, program where residents went either uh, three, three years or five years. It was a pyramidal program. And uh, Tom Almy, the, my chairman, was very disappointed that Cornell didn't accept me. I was interviewed by, uh, by Dr. Taylor up at Columbia. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a similar program, three years and five years. And I also didn't get into that one. And I, then I was interviewed at NYU by Gordon Douglas. Uh, that was a four-year program. That's what I thought, uh, ostensibly up front. And he. Uh, um, uh, said, uh, okay, uh, if you're interested in this program, you better let me know in 24 hours or else you don't have a chance. To. I told him in 24 hours that I would take the program and I was, uh, and, I, and I started there. And uh, what was kind of interesting about that was that when I actually started the, re oh, Tom Almy told me, uh, don't worry about it. if things not, don't work out for you, there's a candle in the window. You can always come <laughs> back to medicine. I, I hadn't mentioned that he offered me a first year position, a residency in, in medicine. And we had 27 interns, so only nine re received the first year residency. So I started my residency at Bellevue, and um, on my first day there, I learned uh, to my chagrin that of the eight residents who were selected to start, Two were dropped at the end of the first year. Uh, at the end of the first year, four go on to what's called a three-year program, which is entirely separate and different from the two who go on to the major four-year program. And I went into uh, what we might be called today a deep depression. <laughs> and uh, uh, and the, what was even worse about it was that uh, among my uh, resident mates, one was the grandson of the Potter version, who had worked with uh, Gordon Douglas for, for years and whose older brother was Gordon Douglas' best personal friend in the world. And the other was a fellow by the name of Marty Carr who had gone to NYU Medical School and had written co-authored papers with Gordon Douglas and Lewis Thomas on trophoblast and peripheral blood. And I said, I'm finished. I'm, I'm ne I'll never get one of those two positions, and I really. But you did. I, yeah, but I wasn't really interested in the others, so I, I applied to Women's Hospital. Uh, the um, uh, Carl Javert was the chairman at the time, and uh, I was interviewed by about 20 different people on one day, and uh, it was a very favorable interview. They were an interesting program. They took one person every three months, continuously. And it was a three-year program, and uh, but I told them that if I got the Bellevue four-year job, I would stay at Bellevue. Then I got a disappointing letter from them a week later saying they were closing St. Women's Hospital oh, yeah. because the building was falling apart. And I said, oh my, I'm not going to get the four-year job. The one place I applied to is closing its doors. And I, I went on a, a, a one-week's vacation around Christmas time. And um, I go down to the mailbox during this time, and there's a letter from Women's Hospital. It says, We've, you've got the, first, the position July 1. We decided to stay open. I come upstairs, and I get a phone call from a friend of mine in the residency program at Bellevue, Dr. Gordon Douglas, had just posted the list of the names of who's going to be the, uh, the four-year program, and I was one of them. So <laughs> there you uh, were, and that twice. was it, and that, and that sort of did it. Um, I have always had a very good relationship with Gordon Douglas. What, what all went on in your career after you finished the residency? Well, I, I went to the Army, spent two years at, uh, at Fort Bragg in uh, North Carolina in obstetrics and gynecology, did lots and lots of cases, did some radical hysterectomies, and oh. Rip Reaver was the colonel at oh, the Walter right. Reed, yes. and they threatened to court-martial me if I didn't send the next case back up to <laughs> Walter Reed. And, uh, He's but, a good person. Yeah, it was. And, uh, but I enjoy, I met uh, lots of people. Uh, 
at, at we had about six or seven obstetricians at Fort Bragg. I uh, did four breach deliveries my first afternoon there. <laughs> uh, Bob Kennison was one of my uh, friends there, and people that I still uh, see today, Stewie Gottesfeld and so on. When you finished the military, then what? Well, Gordon Douglas brought me back, back into the department uh, in an academic way, and he wanted to know, uh, he, I said, well, where's my office going to be at, the, at Bellevue Hospital? He says, well, I've got an empty room on the gynecology <laughs> service, so you're chief of gynecology. I said, but I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in obstetrics. Well, in the that's where the room is, and that's what I'm going to be doing. This was before subspecialization. And uh, I started practice uh, at the same time. NYU was unusual in the sense that uh, uh, the faculty practice area was totally supported by the individuals practicing there. The medical school, school paid nothing. Yeah. No, did not pay for liability insurance or secretaries or phones or oh, office. Yeah. You paid rent and all the rest. Yeah. And it when was, uh, when all that finished, where did you practice? I pra yeah. practiced at yeah. at the faculty practice yeah. area yeah. at NYU, which was uh, on 30, uh, 30th Street and First Avenue. Uh, had a very sizable practice, and I spent. A tremendous amount of my academic responsibility time teaching students and doing administrative work and virtually no research and very little in the way of publications. There was no time to do anything other than see patients and I, I did deliveries and I was in solo practice. Um, uh, it, uh, and and uh, I, I had a pretty good income. How, how did you happen to get involved with ACOG? At the well, right around Sophisticated that, level. I, I'm, I'm not sure what the first, and, but right around that time, I was asked by, um, uh, I'm not sure, it may have been Erwin Mercats, if I could help out uh, on uh, NACOG. Mm -hmm. NACOG had a meeting, and they uh, they really couldn't develop their own program. So I, I did the program for NACOG, and, uh, and over the time, I started becoming active in the district I, I was uh, exhibits chairman one year for the annual district meeting, and I was uh, program chairman for a couple of years, and I was a general conference chairman for the district two annual meeting in 1978 in Puerto Rico. Uh, and uh, after that, I pretty much uh, lost contact. I never moved up in the, uh, in the political side. I didn't become a district officer. I was section chairman of Manhattan. But I uh, never moved into the district uh, officership, and that was about 1980. What, what enticed you to come to ACOG as the career went on? Well, I, I, I had a, a, an interval stopover as chief of OBGYN at New York Infirmary Beekman, in which I was more academically productive than when I was at NYU. But after 12 years there, so that's a total of about 27 years, uh, I found myself doing more and more things that were unrelated to my patients and my practice and my department. I was doing an awful lot of traveling, and I was finding my interests gravitating more to a, to a more global uh, kind of activity in obstetrics and gynecology. And uh, I went and did a master's in public administration while I was chief of OBGYN at, uh, at uh, New York at Infirmary Beekman downtown. Uh, and uh, Masters in Public Administration. It's like a public health master's, but no epidemiology. And did it at New, mm. New York University. I got the degree in 1990. And then, um, uh, actually, a fellow by the name Bud Purnell, who you probably know. Very well. I was at, a, I was at a, uh, an ACOG a uh, annual meeting, and he said to me, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Pierce is retiring. And, uh, and and uh, and Don now and and Dr. Hale's taken over, and I understand Dr. Kamenetsky is going to retire. Why don't you? You got the ideal credentials for it, and um, I I apply, actually applied for, for two positions at ACOG, but I the one I I got was the uh, practice activity. Yeah, what year was that? 1993. So, uh, right, you called me on in March, and said you're not going to believe this, but <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, I, I believe Good. it. And, and then the annual clinical meeting was uh, here in Washington that year. Mm -hmm. And in November of 93, I actually started on the payroll. Yep. 
Time has flown, yes. <laughs> or it seems to me to have flown anyway. And we have a, have a few minutes left. How, how would you uh, describe what you've done with ACOG and uh, it's been how a it's fit in with your life career? It's been interesting time. The, the, the key button issues, uh, uh, I'd say the, the most important thing I've done is develop the uh, format and concept of the practice bulletin, which is really the leading document that the college produces now. Prior to that time, we had educational bulletins yep. and committee opinions, and sometimes there was a duplication of effort. We'd get one on hemoglobin optics from the education division and one. Right. So we, we managed to consolidate that. There are a number of really hot button issues going on. I mean, practice guidelines became almost a necessity. I think 25, 30 years ago, if anyone suggested to our executive board they were going to give prescriptive guidelines, right. they'd be fired and That's drummed right. out. Right. But they, they demanded it at the time, so I've done that. Uh, performance measures are a hot button issue. Uh, our, our members are, are yeah. unhappy about lots of things, and they, do, they don't get paid enough, yeah. they've got professional liability, that kind of thing. Yeah, the world has become more it's complex changed. indeed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do we get to keep you for a while? Uh, actually, <laughs> I told the executive board last Friday. Don't that, give it away any secrets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, that 1997 would be my last year, and that actually would have been starting my 15th year at the college, and I just thought it was time to move on, and uh, I really enjoyed my time here at the college, and I think I've made some Well, you, you really have. I, I, what's always seemed to me is that you brought a, a broad background in when you were, had to deal with broad issues and lots of complicated people. <laughs> well, I tried. It was fun. <laughs> Stanley. Still is. Good to talk with okay. you. Thank you.